So we'll, we'll, we're back in session. Um, and uh, the next item is the Audit and Finance Committee report. Mr. Brent. Convocation. Um, so, uh, what we have before you is uh, the budget uh, for this year. And if you go to board books at tab three, and the motion itself begins at page uh, 43, I believe. Let me be sure. Um, so let me just uh, uh, <coughs> provide a bit of background. Uh, there's a lengthier budget document which incorporates, uh, incorporates tables, graphs, and other uh, narratives. And you may recall that in previous years, budget material um, became heavy and so forth. And what we've tried to do this year, and I uh, shout out to my former co-chair, Mr. Wardle, who, when he was co-chair, worked with staff to try and have much more readable, understandable budget materials. You see the charts and the bar graphs and so forth that are there. Um, the also, uh, we also have a three-year financial plan uh, and the 2017 budget. Um, this is a combination of a budget process uh, that was approved by Convocation in May. I want to acknowledge uh, the input of the Audit and Finance Committee since then. Uh, the previous members of the committee, including my co-chair, Mr. Wardle, worked on this um, uh, prior to the new committee. And uh, we also had a budget information session in September. Um, we approached the budget with the following goals. First, to ensure that the Law Society's core functions are appropriately resourced in order to achieve the mandate established by the Law Society Act. Second, to provide uh, resources for the strategic plan, and there's a number of new initiatives that are incorporated into this budget. Um, we're also incorporating responsible use of the fund balances to mitigate the annual fee increases, and we have fund balance policies that guide us in that regard. And uh, we are continuing with the idea that there is a three-year budget forecast going out. Um, so bottom line is uh, the approach that we're taking in the budget this year is going to result in a $50 increase in annual fees for paralegals and lawyers. The fee uh, that we had in place uh, last year of uh, 1866 has been in place for three years. And the paralegal fee of 996 has been in place since 2013. Um, and though uh, we prided ourselves on keeping the fees flat uh, for the past number of years, in light of some of the strategic initiatives, we thought it was now an appropriate time to, to raise the fee. Um, uh, looking at the uh, bigger picture in terms of fees for the profession this year, Treasury, you'll see that while the fees are increasing by $50, uh, there is also uh, an opportunity for a $50 credit if, uh, if you enroll in an authorized uh, payment plan, so the fee would remain flat. And we also note that um, last year, or th sorry, last convocation, um, we approved an insurance levy which will re result in a reduction of $400. So overall, the amount that the profession is going to pay this year will be less than it was last year. Now, let me uh, look at the major budgetary assumptions and factors. So the first point is the profession continues to grow, and the 2017 budget incorporates an annual increase of 700 in the number of lawyers, and an increase of 550 in the number of paralegals. And uh, what that means is that uh, the revenue will be increasing and we based the revenue uh, based on a full-time equivalent of about 40,200 lawyers and 5,600 paralegals. Um, and to some extent, while we try to achieve economies of scale, obviously with the growth of the profession, it does result in increased expenditures. The 2017 budget also includes a salary and benefit provision of 3% to provide for merit adjustments, funding increase, employee benefit costs, 
and compensation for lagging the market over the past three years. Um, and we adhere to expected market rates for 2017 and it gives us some flexibility to accommodate operational changes. <coughs> and I know that when some people uh, have raised questions about this, a 3% increase does not mean that every staff member is going to get a 3% uh, increase. What this is an overall envelope uh, that allows uh, our staff to manage within that envelope. In some cases, uh, people will not get increases. In some cases, there might be new hires. In some cases, people might move up uh, and get a more significant than 3% uh, increase. Lawyer Compensation Fund uh, grant limit has increased to 500000 again, a step that we took at our past convocation. And that has resulted uh, uh, in part because of uh, greater claims. And we've, uh, as, a, we've, as a result of that, we've had to increase the amount uh, of the compensation fund levy. For the 2017 budget, the CPD projection reflect status quo uh, in the range of about 50,000 attendees. Um, the lawyer and the paralegal licensing process fees have been kept on change for 2016. Budget for capital expenditures um, uh, includes a provision of 2.1 million representing the initial investment in the modernization of the society's licensee database. And part of that is we've had the same database for many years uh, that database cannot enable the society to move forward to the next level in terms of providing service to the members and providing information to us and we felt it was time to invest in a new database to achieve some of those operational efficiencies. Um, I note uh, just in terms of the overall fees that we're recommending to convocation uh, that fees for uh, in other law societies range from 2057 in BC to 2520 dollars in Alberta so our annual fees here are in fact uh, at the uh, low end of the fee spectrum and um, so that's it with respect to the fees with respect to the library co budget you'll see the budget is also before you it's been incorporated into the materials um, uh, there's an ongoing review and uh, what we've done in, in this year is we've agreed to increase the funding uh, as requested uh, but we've made clear that on a go forward basis that until the transition process is in place uh, that we will not be increasing uh, the overall funding in accordance with uh, inflation. Uh, we've also determined as part of our budgeting process as we did with the Federation where every year as the number of lawyers increased the amount uh, of payments the Federation increased uh, as part of our budget process on a go forward basis we're looking to say well look how much is necessary and we'll fund what is necessary as opposed to these per capita fundings. Um, so I'm not going to go on at any other length uh, Treasurer I expect there may be some questions. In closing I want to thank the staff uh, uh, Rob Lapper, Wendy Tysol, Fred Grady, and the other members uh, for their support through the budget process. I want to thank the other members of the Audit and Finance Committee, uh, including the members of the Audit and Finance Committee who were there when the work got started uh, earlier this year. And I also want to thank the benchers who came to the budget information session for the input they had into it. Uh, uh, the motions uh, are set out. Uh, they're there in the materials at page 42 and so I would move uh, those motions uh, seconded by Suzanne uh, Clement. Thank you. Yeah, so One motion is at page 42 and the library co-motion is a separate motion at page 37. Okay. okay. Any discussion? Comment? Yes, Mr. Evans. Thanks, <coughs> Treasurer. Uh, my question to you and uh, the committee is whether we are doing anything to try to uh, make sure that all lawyers are pay paying equivalent support for our libraries by way of the law associations. Many lawyers choose not to belong to law associations and therefore <clears throat> thereby avoid paying towards the library in their local association. And more is up to all the other lawyers to make sure that the county law libraries are adequately funded. And I think the first step along this way is to ask in the annual member's return what is the, what county law association 
is, uh, are you a member of or is, represents your area? And that way we can get some information as to how many lawyers are not in the law associations and how much money we are short because of that. So I would like to urge the ventures and administration to follow through. Okay, thank you very much for that. Mr. Brett, do you have anything? So I think that's obviously something that would be helpful to raise with the uh, Library Co. Board as part of the issues that they're going to be considering on the transitional. There's a number of issues like that, who has access to the libraries, who's paying for them, and so forth. Mr. Lerner. I'd just like an explanation as to what paragraph A at the top of page 38 means. <laughs> Let's all read it. <laughs> That there will be no further increase to the Law Society contribution. So what, just for the benefit of those who are not as adept at Mr. Lerner in, in uh, navigating, paragraph A says there will be no further increases to the Law Society contribution to Library Co. beyond the 2017 amount unless there's an agreement between Library Co. shareholders, the Law Society Federation on a transition plan and the resources necessary to affect that plan. So this is um, uh, part of the overall discussion. When the transition process began, uh, there was an understanding that the funding of Library Co. would be held flat pending the transition, and the transition process should come forward, whereby the actual demands and needs of the profession would be assessed, and we would fund that. So the, the old process essentially was there was a flat fee. The flat fee kept increasing every year because, as we called new, new people, the funding went up. And, and what the committee said and, and, uh, and what uh, was set out at the time was, look, we should fund the libraries in accordance with what their needs are. And I think everybody understands that the libraries play an important role. But an idea, it's a bit like what we did with the Federation. The, fed, the way we used to fund the Federation was there a flat per capita fee. So every year their funding went up, but we didn't get an explanation from the Federation as to what the money was going to be used for and what money they actually required. So I think the point that is being made here, to be clear to convocation, is that the result of the Library Co. review may well result in an increase in funding to libraries. If the needs of the profession are such that they require increased funding and they put together a plan as to what's necessary and so forth, we will fund that. But the old process whereby there was a flat amount that could be used, however, without any sort of accountability, uh, we didn't think was part of a, a good budget process. Ms. Horvath? Just, just on Mr. Evans's question, um, the libraries are funded by the the levy of $194 for every lawyer licensee, not by the association. I understand, if I could, Mr. Uh, Treasurer, yes. I understand that, I understand we all pay the same amount to the Law Society, but many lawyers do not belong to their law associations, and those of us who belong pay $50, $75, or $100 to our associations to support the libraries. And many lawyers are not paying anything through the county associations, to the support of the libraries. So there, there, what, what, I, what I would say, I understand that the, the way it works in the local is that some people belong to local associations and they pay additional fees. And in addition to the libraries, but they also get educational programs, they get to participate. Oh, yes. And there's all sorts of programs that are made available. So I think if, you know, to be diplomatic, I think both of uh, you are correct in the sense that there is a flat funding that we provide to the libraries to support all of that. The local law associations, in addition, can have other programs that are funded through the local law associations. And I think it's a fair statement that some local law associations are much more active and presumably charge greater fees or accumulate greater fees because they have more people who participate. Some are less active. And, and so certainly from the law society's perspective, and, and in our committee's perspective, our view is that the law library should be funded to provide the services that are necessary for the profession to, to, to practice law. And we will work with Library Co. through the transition process to identify what those needs are and ensure that they're adequately funded. <coughs> Make Thank sure you. all lawyers pay equivalently. <laughs> are there any other comments or questions on the budget? Yes, Mr. Gottlieb. Uh, for you, Mr. Shavis, to Mr. Brett. Well, Mr. Brett, as a sole practitioner that 
basically uses generic software programs, including a generic database program, which I then make a program. Sorry, Mr. Garvey, I think you should move to oh, close sorry. to a microphone. I doubt anyone on the phone will be hearing you. <coughs> I guess I'm mired in the old days, Treasurer. I'm going to have to uh, do, do it this way. Uh, as a sole practitioner, uh, as I said, I, I rely on generic programs. And in the years I've used a generic database program, now I'm learning a new generic database program, and I will make appropriate adjustments to it to suit my purposes. The programs cost next to nothing compared to um, the seven million that we're going to be spending for a uh, new database program for the Law Society. Uh, so I'm astounded when I see a figure like this. It might be justified, but I'm, the question I have is, number one, is this program getting developed from scratch? Is it impossible to find uh, a program that would suit our purposes, that appropriate adjustments can be made to it, that would cost us a lot less than this? So I thought you were going to ask me an easy question, like you know how to do Anton pillar orders. But <laughs> uh, so what I would say about this is that uh, the the audit and finance committee question staff the, the questions you asked there were good questions, and we raised with uh, is it not possible simply to update the existing software, and the answer that that we got and there was a uh, an IT expert who staff had consulted was that. The, the database simply based was based on an old platform that after 20 years is simply not, it, it's not feasible. It no longer has the capabilities to do the types of things that we need to do. So it was clear that at some point we needed to move on to a new platform. I guess it's a little bit like moving from Microsoft 7 to Microsoft 8 or whatever. And um, as part of that, uh, the decision was made. It, the database program will obviously use, you know, existing software, but it's like any sophisticated organization like this, you have to customize it. So the committee also raised questions about, well, look, you know, these software development processes are fraud and, you know, they can be difficult and so forth. And the idea uh, being here is that it's going to take some time. It's not something that we're just going to buy off the shelf. We're going to have existing software. It has to be customized to deal with the needs of the law society. And certainly we at the committee thought that this was a good investment because long run, we think that it will facilitate the communications between the law society and its members. But it will also give us as convocation the ability to generate information that the old program simply doesn't have the capability to deal with. So. Uh, we felt it was time to invest, and I, you know, obviously, whenever you're investing in new software, you can't guarantee that it's not going to be a few bumps along the road. But I can assure you that our committee is going to be asking uh, those kind of questions as the project goes forward. Ms. Esprit. Uh, thank you, Trevor. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first about uh, page 38B, as opposed to A. Um, uh, the paragraph reads, in future, the Law Society will fund and report legal information and library support expenses in the same way it treats program expenses and contributions to external organizations, not just at the levy. So we will not be seeing that show up as a, as a per member levy. It will be part of the general budget. Correct. Uh, will it remain its own line item in yes. the general budget? So we'll st still be able to find it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, a little bit further on if I can get this to do what it's supposed to do, which it seems not to want to do. There we go. Uh, I believe it's uh, page 52. Yes. Um, major budgetary assumptions. Uh, the middle of that list, the con contribution to the parental leave assistance plan has been reduced to zero. And I, uh, I understand that this is because of declining utilization, but declining utilization doesn't say to me Zero so what, what I would say is that we in past, so the first question that Ms. Vesprey asked is the library code will, will be a line item so everybody will see how much money is going and we would be coming and saying well 
we budgeted seven million last year, we're gonna budget seven and a half million this year, and here's why there's increased demand for access to this database or, or whatever. So it, it will continue there, it just won't be a separate item on the actual account. The, the second question that you raised is, what's happened is as part of the funding of the uh, parental leave assistance program, funds are put aside. And so funds have been put aside to fund this program in previous years, which haven't been utilized. So the funds are there to meet what the expected demand is, and we just didn't need to top it up this year, which is why you, you, the, 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 that item was raised there. So, but those funds are not being sent off to some They're not being issue. sent off. The funds are there, and to the extent that people apply and are accepted, there's adequate funds in the budget to fund them. But thank you. And uh, my last question, and this may be just that I couldn't find it in the budget, uh, we've got an income labeled licensing process, and I could not find an expense with exactly the same label. There is an expense for the department, <coughs> but there isn't an expense that says licensing uh, process, or if it is, I so it, find it, it would be on the expense side of the equation. There's expenses that are related to PD and C, professional development and competence. Those expenses would include the licensing process. But is it ever is it broken down to show just the licensing process? Uh, That's the part that I couldn't find. Thank you, Trevor. I think somewhere I, I I haven't committed all the material, but I think that there is somewhere in the materials a, a, a part that looks specifically at PD and C and break down what the expenses are within that department. Oh, okay. There is, and I, I will provide it to Ms. Kester. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the room? Oh. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Any questions or comments on the telephone? Hearing none, then we will put, uh, we'll do two separate uh, motions. The first, the motion to approve the budget at page 42, moved by Mr. Probably we should do the library co budget first, Treasurer, because that's incorporated in the second motion, so. As you wish. We'll do the library co budget first, moved by Mr. Brett, seconded by um, uh, Ms. Clemon. Okay. Um, all in favor? Any opposed? Any opposed on the telephone? Motion is carried. Then we'll go to page 42 to approve the budget. The same mover and seconders. Um, all, of, all in favor in the room. Any opposed? Any opposed on the telephone? Thank you. The motions are carried. Thank you, Mr. Brett. The conference is in lecture mode. Yeah, so we're going to just to, Ms. Leeper has to leave shortly and she's going to give us a brief update on the work of the Governance Task Force next. <coughs> Thank you, Treasurer. Members of Convocation, on September 22nd, 2016, Convocation approved a governance task force in line with the strategic planning goal to, quote, review the Law Society's governance structure, including achieving the goals of transparency, inclusiveness, effectiveness, efficiency, and costs, and where appropriate, obtain the opinions of experts. Le 22 septembre 2016, le Conseil a approuvé la création d'un groupe de travail sur la gouvernance conformément au bout suivant du plan stratégique. <coughs> examiner, examiner la structure de gouvernance du barreau à l'égard de la transparence, de l'inclusion, de l'efficacité, de l'efficience et des coûts et aux besoins obtenus d'opinion d'experts. Use set us a mandate which includes a wide ranging discussion of governance issues from practical process issues to researching best practices and looking at how we are structured. We've been asked to report back as we gather research and as our work progresses. So here we are, the Governance Task Force had its first meeting. And today we want to give you some idea of how we oriented the issues, what you might expect over the first few months of our work and how you might play a role. So I'm gonna speak very briefly about context, principles and work plan. Context, the context. We are in a period of rapid change in the profession in Ontario. Licensing processes, of course, are on our agenda again. Access to justice is a growing concern. Digital disruption, which affects many other sectors, is also now a big factor in the regulated legal professional and services space. Questions of how we will effectively regulate entities are all significant policy concerns for our term and beyond. The independence of the lawyer and paralegal professions and our foundational principles will not change, but how we protect and deliver on these foundations is really what you've asked us to consider. 
And signs of change have already been signaled by the Law Society. <coughs> we have increased our consultative processes on any number of policy decisions. We use both traditional and social media to do so. We have reached out into the province as part of our work, and this has been appreciated and noticed. We've opened up convocation through webcasting, and we reflect a more diverse bar than ever before, one that will continue to change and demand more from us. We know likewise that the public will have greater expectations of us, and we need to be responsive. We need to be future-oriented, be aware of the realities of those entering our professions, and respond to the complex issues facing legal service providers and the public. That's our context. Les Principes. So with an awareness of this con context, the group began our first meeting discussing principles. And some of those are embedded in the mandate that I, I just read. Transparency, inclusiveness, effectiveness, efficiency, and costs. And these are reinforced by Section 4.2 of the Law Society Act, which requires we act in a timely, open, and efficient manner. We also talked about principles of equity, evidence-based policy making, and ongoing <coughs> engagement. So this morning, one of the things that we wanted to say to Convocation is that these are the principles that will guide work and our reporting to you. Preliminary work plan, plan d'action. So we have started to consider a list of issues. Our next meeting in November will be to continue with deciding on an appropriate work plan. Nous entendons travailler en même temps sur ce deux grandes catégories de questions. D'abord, des questions pratiques de procédures qui peuvent entraîner des changements en politique ou en règlement administratif, mais vraisemblablement pas de vaste étude ou recherche et dont les chancelier sera plus court ou qui devrait être abordé le plus tôt possible. Il s'agira, par exemple, de voir si l'évaluation des membres du conseil d'administration est justifiée ou utile dans notre structure et donc envisager un outil d'auto-évaluation à cette fin qui porte sur les besoins de formation des conseillers et le rôle dans le barreau, tel que noté dans le plan stratégique 2015 à 2019. Nous avons la chance d'avoir amorcé le travail avec le personnel sur ce sujet. So we plan to work concurrently on two issues. The first are practical process issues that may require policy or by change, will not likely need extensive study or research, and should or can be accomplished in a shorter time. <coughs> One such example is exploring whether evaluation of ventures as board members is useful in our structure and considering a self-assessment tool for this purpose. This would relate to Ventures' education needs and our role at the Law Society, as noted in the strategic plan. And staff have begun some preliminary work on this idea already. The other category, longer term, will look at how convocation, the treasurer's office, and committees are constituted to do their work, the potential for election reform, and even whether our historic name continues to be the best description of what we do and how we should be naming ourselves to the communities that we serve. Throughout all of these conversations, we plan to seek out research, consult as appropriate, and find the best methods for the particular issues. We will ask the questions, look for best practices, and bring our recommendations to you. So we will also try to report to you on an ongoing basis, briefly, but as we go along, so that Convocation is aware of the work, because it involves all of us. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leeper. Um, uh, I, I, any, if I'm willing to have a, any brief questions related to the process that she set out, if, if any, at this time? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, Mr. McDowell, Professional Regulation. <clears throat>
So this, this deals with the circumstances in which a regulatory meeting can be held as opposed to an information to attend or an IT. So in 2006, the regulatory meeting was authorized by convocation. And the criteria are there at uh, paragraph 6. But you'll see that at 6 sub c, uh, one of the requirements was it is not in the public interest to deal with the matter by way of an invitation to attend, given a bit of confidential nature, because the conduct of the licensee has been the subject of comment in the public forum. And there's some elaboration of that. So, I guess at the instance of PAC, uh, the committee has considered and agreed that a regulatory meeting should, should be capable of being held uh, even when there is no public uh, notice about it, where there's no public component to it, because in, in the appropriate circumstances, having a meeting which is held in public to counsel or to admonish a licensee is a, is a very effective tool and is thought to be more effective than a private ITA. So that is the proposed uh, motion at the top there, paragraph three. Do I have a seconder? I'll second. Oh, thank you. Mr. Rosenthal? Or, or, or sorry, it was Ms. Strasburg. Ms. Strasburg, okay. thanks. So happy to take any questions, but it's a pretty narrow uh, measure. Any comments or questions in the room? Yes, Ms. Papa Georgia? Um, well, I have a question in general about uh, the process. Like, should I come up there? Should I go up there? Yes, please. Oh, I'm plugging it. Okay, so I won't, I won't bring this. I was kind of looking forward to Jay unplugged. <laughs> 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 passing out here. All right, so this is my question. Um, just the process that we have uh, at PAC. I hope you don't mind Jan that I'm going to mention you, Janice. Janice? Janice Krieger sent around an email some three, four months ago about PAC's process and asking that um, the process at PAC, where you're deciding what to do with a licensee, whether they're referred forward, should be changed so that it becomes devoid of information that would allow people to uh, know the personal characteristics of the people being evaluated and deciding which stream they're going to go down. And the reason for this, um, as we know in the racialized task force, as well as all of the Harvard studies, is that is a, there is a very strong unconscious bias. And I guess my question is, as we look at you're making changes now, have you considered that particular issue? Because that issue, I believe, was also emailed to the committee. So Ms. Horvath, with your permission, has generously agreed to let me duck this question. <laughs> sure. I, mean, I, I would note that it's not really part of the motion. I, 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 I'm, I'm aware that this issue was raised at the Professional <laughs> Regulation Committee and presumably is something that the Professional Regulation Committee, um, among many other things, may be looking at. I think is that's that right, but I mean, if there's, if there's a question about present practice, I would, would defer to my colleague, Ms. Horvath. Uh, I'm not sure we need to, briefly, Ms. Horvath, uh, but I don't think we need to, to go very far on that. I don't, I don't mean to suggest there's no merit to Ms. Papagiorgio's comment, but it's a little bit of a diversion. Well, I'm happy not to. All right. Okay. Um, Ms. Ross was next. Mr. McDowell, and I, I, these are just process questions, and uh, just for the sake of the record, uh, the regulatory meeting you've noted obviously is going to be a matter of public record. Who will be conducting the regulatory meetings? Could you advise us that on the record? And secondly, will the fact of regulatory meetings that are being scheduled and will be held uh, going to be posted, for example, on the Law Society Tribunal website where the public and the media would normally think to look. Thank you. I believe subject to some tinkering that the regulatory meetings would be held before a, a disciplined panel. Uh, actually, they're held, uh, but members of PAC conduct them, Mr. Right, so. McDowell, and they're not posted in advance. There can be scheduling difficulties about them, but after they have taken place, there's a public summary 
of the rec of the regulatory meeting, including the name of the licensee as published in the ORs. <coughs> Ms. Ross. So if they're only published after the fact, how does that address our our principal position to be transparent and open to the public? If the public and, and journalists, for example, only learn about them after the fact. I'll ask the present chair of PAC to, uh, to answer that question. <laughs> So regulatory meetings are only held if the licensee agrees to them. And there's an agreed statement of fact that they agree to and the Law Society agrees to. And it's that statement of fact that gets published in the ORs. The actual regulatory hearing is held before um, a panel of any three benchers. It's generally three members of PAC. They're generally held in this room and they come in and we discuss the issues with them. There's no finding of any sort of guilt or liability and there's no admission of any guilt or liability apart from what is in the agreed statement of facts. And that's what a regulatory hearing is. It's a regulatory, sorry, a regulatory meeting. It's the same as an ITA apart from the public published component. Any other, no, sorry, Mr. Galati, I think, you had your hand up. I, it was, I watched the, the whole election last night, so I didn't get much sleep. I'm not sure I'm understanding this amendment. So what is not being, what's different here than the, from the previous proceedings? Well, the, the IG is held privately. Right. So it, it used to be that unless a judge or a court or a newspaper had said the conduct of this lawyer, for example, was inappropriate, that the rigs would be, uh, would be used. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Evans. Thank you. <coughs> I think uh, Ms. Horvath answered part of my question that the invitation uh, uh, to uh, the licensee could be declined by the licensee, but I'm wondering if it would be appropriate to uh, have a notice to attend uh, rather than just an invitation to attend so that the, uh, the uh, Attendance by the licensee can be mandated by by the PAC and perhaps streamline our adjudication process by having some of these matters dealt with uh, more expeditiously. Well, I guess the concern would be if the idea that this is is a voluntary process in which there's no admission or finding of liability, that's a little bit inconsistent with the idea of a notice. It's a, it's a different issue than what's before us now, um, which is uh, an invitation to attend. Um, so it's, again, not really related to this motion. Um, is there anybody else in the room who has any comments or questions? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. On the telephone, any questions? Hearing none, again, this is moved by Mr. McDowell, seconded by Ms. Strasburg. Um, all in favor? Anyone in the room opposed? Anyone on the phone opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you. Um, the conference is in lecture mode. Now, uh, Mr. Mercer, you're going to notice another professional regulation matter. This is a report for information for convocation. As Convocation is aware, in June, the Advertising and Fee Arrangements Working Group provided an interim report uh, containing both issues raised and uh, tentative directions uh, suggested. Input was sought uh, by the end of September. Uh, I want to tell you that we've now received nearly 80 submissions from 20 organizations and 59 individuals, including from lawyers, paralegals, firms, the academy, insurers, and associations representing lawyers, insurers, and injured people, uh, not the same organizations to be clear. Uh, it's clear from a re review of the submissions thus far received that there are a number of different perspectives on the advertising and fee arrangements issues. It's clear within the professions how people do business, how people uh, attract clients, affect the, their views on uh, on how, what arrangement should be allowed. It's clear that insurers have issues uh, and perspectives. The same is true for organizations of injured people. Uh, 
that makes these issues always difficult because uh, where we have uh, alignment uh, within the professions and with the public life is easier, where we have a number of different perspectives, uh, issues are more challenging. From a preliminary review, it appears that there are some questions that are more straightforward than other questions. I suppose that's no great surprise. There are some areas where there is relative alignment and relative consensus. There are other areas where that's not true. Uh, and of course, the spectrum <coughs> goes further than that. What I want to tell you uh, with respect to the work of our group is that we're meeting, we've already met once to review uh, the submissions received. We'll be meeting again this week. Uh, my expectation is that we will uh, attempt to delineate those issues which can be dealt with more easily than others and that we will bring forward recommendations through <coughs> the Professional Regulation Committee uh, to convocation, uh, not all at once, but as we're able to move them forward uh, so that we don't end up many months from now with a big report. And what we want to do is to move deliberately, uh, and thoughtfully, and promptly as we can. Uh, the other thing that I want to, to note is that uh, one of the points raised in our June interim report is that bylaws, professional conduct rules, and commentary and changes to them are only part of the puzzle. Uh, we currently have the Professional Regulation Division charged with investigating, where appropriate, compliance with our existing rules. Much of the work of PRD is unseen, with thousands of matters dealt with, sometimes with guidance, direction, and diversion, but only hundreds of matters going forward into the disciplinary process each year. As a result, there is much activity, but much which is unseen. And that's why I want to, to tell you uh, what is happening uh, at a high level within PRD in respect to these issues. The Law Society Act, as you know, requires investigative confidentiality. Uh, that makes it difficult uh, for us to observe what's happening and for the profession and the public to observe what's happening. But I can report that one of the early steps taken by our new Executive Director of Professional Regulation has been to form a strategic priority team within PRD to undertake investigations in this area with a view to ensuring coordinated and policy-focused attention is brought to bear. This proactive approach reflects the significant importance placed by the Law Society on this area. I hope to report further in the new year. Thank you very much, Mr. Mercer. Um, anybody wish to ask any questions of Mr. Mercer on this update? The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Any questions on the telephone? Hearing none, we'll move forward. Thank you, Mr. Mercer. Uh, the the uh, Tribunal Committee, Ms. Murchie. <coughs> Um, I too have, uh, have rule amendments uh, uh, for uh, convocations approval um, and Mr. Wright uh, is here as well in the event there are uh, uh, questions uh, of uh, a significant nature. But let me uh, take you for, uh, through them first so that um, uh, everyone has a chance to uh, review and understand what, uh, what is going on here. The tribunal report is at page 254 of board books, and the motion that I am moving is at page 257. These um, amendments, that we're seeking approval for amendments to the hearing division and appeal division rules of practice and procedure. And the amendments um, come out of the ongoing implementation of the tribunal's new electronic case management system. And they're also a result of uh, the ongoing efforts to streamline the rules and, and make them more accessible to the public uh, um, uh, as we go forward. Um, in terms of uh, the particular rules, you'll see the, they're, they're set out uh, on page 257, the key issues and considerations. First of all, there's changes to the uh, rule and forms of application. That's rule nine, and the forms have been simplified, and there's a provision for information sheets um, that, is, uh, that allows for personal information that's not relevant or necessary 
uh, for publication to be filed separately with the tribunal office. Um, there are separate notices of application for each uh, type of uh, proceeding that references the statutory test, and, and you'll see the, uh, uh, the change notices at pages 265 to 270 of board books if you just want to get an idea of what they look like. Um, the rule also provides that um, the uh, law society will electronically file the uh, notice of application and the information sheet. Uh, and it provides that the notices of application will be served first and then filed with the tribunal, which is a change from the current practice. Um, the information sheet is a separate information sheet with personal information, uh, as I said, and it's not, there's no intention to post it uh, or make it uh, public. Um, the next uh, rule is Rule 10. It's a rule respecting service, and there's simply simplified language there. Uh, it also provides for email service without consent. There are some amendments to the uh, Rule 21 on interlocutory suspensions. It provides that interlocutory suspensions uh, are to be set as a separate type of proceeding. So this ensures personal service uh, of the uh, interlocutory uh, suspension motion or application. Uh, and it also allows um, the tribunal's office to collect consistent statistics because right now there's, there's two methods really of um, uh, seeking an interlocutory suspension, and so it's difficult to track. The next um, uh, set of amendments uh, relates to Rule 2603 and um, the, the form of orders. And the, the, the type of the order format is uh, set out uh, at um, uh, Rule 2603, and it's simplified. It, it enables the orders to be published, and it makes summaries unnecessary. And I can, um, thought I'd written down the, uh, the page of it, but you'll see that the, uh, the form for the order is, um, sets out what, what exactly is uh, required, and so that there, there will be consistency uh, throughout. And I lost it uh, here. My apologies, uh, Treasurer. <coughs> 293. 293, thank you very much. Okay, you'll, you'll see the, the order, uh, the form of the order that all of the adjudicators will be uh, asked to complete uh, there. Um, there's also amendments to the appeal rules, and uh, there's a correction on the time to perfect. It's rule 1.2. And you'll see um, uh, those changes uh, on page 336 of board books. The uh, motion uh, that uh, um, I am moving, uh, seconded by Ms. Morali, uh, is uh, at page 257. Uh, and um, as I've said, uh, be happy to entertain questions, or Mr. Wright is here if there's more comprehensive questions. Any questions in the room? On the top. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. <coughs> uh, hearing nothing from the telephone, I'll put it to a vote. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Anyone opposed on the on the telephone? The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms. McGrath. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGrath. The Ms. McGrath. Is in lecture mode. The secretary's report. You're speaking on behalf of Mr. Vera. <laughs> well, the, election, the election's over. <laughs> Motion is found at pages 365 and 366 of board books, and these changes um, come about as a result of the changes to the law pro policy. Uh, dealing with conded lawyers. These are, um, and it's primarily to exclude claims brought by corporations against the conded lawyers where they are. Sorry, Mr. McDowell is still feeling. <laughs> <laughs>
the effects of last night. <laughs> I can see that. As are we all, Treasurer. Yes. Oh, I'm trying to shove the guy under the table. <laughs> Don't stamp on your iPad just yet. Okay. I would if it wasn't the Law Society. <laughs> Sorry, Ms. McGrath, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the change to the law pro policy dealing with seconded lawyers to exclude claims brought by corp corporations against seconded lawyers where they, the claimant meets the definition of corporate employer under the policy and to extend the $250 per claim defense only coverage for claims against seconded lawyers brought by uh, corporate employers. Um, the, the changes, and if you um, uh, want to look at the track changes page to, to see um, exactly where they are. If you turn to page uh, 370, the change to um, section 914, Roman numeral 1, uh, uh, indicates that uh, the change will be to employers, employed by employers who are not a licensee or licensee law firm. So that's an addition. And then the changes to 5.1 and 5.2 you will find on page 373 of board books. And that essentially um, indicates that licensees who, who are seconded to corporate uh, firms um, uh, shall continue to be employed by their original partnership or uh, association, and uh, their, their uh, coverage will continue. And then 5.2 just uh, change, indicates what the definition of licensee firm um, would be, and that's just a basic housekeeping change. So, if anyone has any questions, and do you have a seconder? Um, no. <laughs> Ms. Krieger. Ms. Krieger. All right, Mr. Chartered. Oh, sorry. Any comments or questions on this bylaw um, amendment? The conference. Anybody? No, no, in <laughs> any uh, questions or comments on the telephone? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor. Any opposed? Any opposed on the telephone? It's a motion is great. Um, thank you, Ms. McGrath. Um, can we just, uh, there seems to be some sound. Someone says it's pigeons or? Uh, oh, it's the radiator. Oh, how interesting. Okay. I can turn the dawdle back on. Yeah, thank you. No, don't do that, Mr. McGrath. <laughs> so that. Uh, concludes the public portion. Uh, we have a few matters in camera, so we will now